Barley. Lawrence Barley is the director of the new Inside, the printed publication of the Marshall Project, which is distributed in hundreds of prisons and jails throughout the United States. He's a couple's public speaker and has provided multimedia content from CNN, PBS, NBC, Lightning News, MSNBC, and more. The new Inside is is <clears throat> is the recent 2020 uh, Izzy Awards. Izzy Awards is for uh, media, um, independent media, stuff like that, for people that I know like that. Outstanding achievement. This brother's dope and dynamic, and this brother has an interesting story. So, Jamie, can you bring our brother Lawrence Barley in tonight? Hey, Yo, what's brother. up, brother? What's up? What's up, what's up brother? What's up? Yo, everybody. Hey, what's up, Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you for coming, man. Thank you for coming. Lawrence, I don't know if you want me to tell your story and the backstory, and then we're going to get to the, get to what you're doing now. I don't know if you want to tell it or, you want, uh, or I tell it. It's up to you, brother. How you want to do it? Right, just ask whatever question you need to ask, and I'll, I'll answer. <laughs> so, so, I'm, so I'm gonna give people a little bit of the backstory how how you came to how you come came into this and and your life and it, it's a great redemption story. I love it, man. So, Lawrence, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is back in 1990 here, in Valley Stream was a movie theater, and there was an incident where a, a young person lost their life with an argument that you and your friends might have had with some other young men, and that led to this person's uh, tragic death. That you was charged with this. Uh, murdered this young person. You did 27 years in prison, but in that time, you learned how to. You got educated, would get your bachelor's degree. You wound up getting your master's degree and helping other, uh, helping other fellow inmates uh, get educated. And we talk about. We're gonna go in. I want to ask about questions about the literacy stuff that you found it while you was incarcerated and stuff like that. So, and then now to the things that you're doing now with with helping publications inside prisons and helping young people figure out their ways through the and being that's incarcerated. So. That's that's a quick in a nutshell. <laughs> that's my brother Lawrence yeah. story right there, man. So welcome, yeah. welcome again, man. Thank so you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Lawrence, welcome. All right. All right. So anybody want to start with the first question? Or I could just jump into my brother Lawrence. He's he's open book. What I understand about his life and stuff like yeah. that. So so Lawrence, I mean, for me, like, how did you find a positivity? And while you was incarcerated from this tragic incident that happened, what was your what was the light inside of you that made you get through this this, this, this tough times? Well, well, it's multiple reasons. You know, when, when you're inside, you have to you have to live for what's right in front of you. you know what I mean, so you have to figure out ways to maintain and way to survive. You know, I went in when I was 17 years old, and I learned how to shave when I was in prison. You know, mm. I grew up to be a man while I was in prison, but I always had like my my. My grandma was there until she got, you know, she got a little bit older and then she couldn't write me no more. But my dad was always around. You know, he would always write me. He would send me a little bit of small change every now and then. But um, the last 14 years of my bid, you know, I had my wife there with me. She came to see me, you know, once a week, every, every, every week, once a week for 14 years. And that's something, you know, someone on the outside have value in you. You got to have value in yourself. You know what I mean? So I just dug into anything I could, you know. Contrary to what people believe, you know, it, um, prisons are called correctional facilities, but they, they're not, they don't really correct anything. For a mm. person uh, to, to correct, he has to correct himself. He, she, or they have to correct themselves. And, um, you know, that's what I did. You know, I got head first into the college programs. You now I took it really seriously. And as the brother D just mentioned, you know, I got my master's degree. I went from a GED to a master's degree. But, you know, even the education, that didn't define me. What defined me is, you know, who, who I thought I was as a, in my core. I didn't think I belonged there in the first place. I didn't think that that would be my conclusion. And I lived my, my life inside like that wasn't my conclusion. But, you know, being inside prison, you got to have like a, a, a stern hysteria to a certain degree to survive inside of that environment. But at the same time, I didn't let it consume me and turn me into something that my family couldn't be proud of. And then, you know, I'm out now and then, you know, I'm just dealing with the world in, in, in a way that um, to make, you know, the people on the inside proud and to make people on the outside um, proud as well. So that's where I'm at. I am today. Mm. You know, you know what, Lawrence, um, so much of who we are and our circumstances are um, dictated and determined by our peers. Who we are around, who who you know, who are our influences? Um, um, it seems as though you know you had one type of influence before you went in, all right, and then um, while you are in there, you have other, I uh, have another peer group, another other influences. How have those influences? Who are some of the people that you met inside when you when you when 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 you went through your when you went through your time, and how did that how did they affect you? How did they change you? 
for the better or for worse? Well, you know, when, when I went in, it was I went in in 1990. It was like at the height of the crack era, so it was madness in the streets. So when I when I went in, they, they gave a, people a lot of time, young brothers a lot of time. It was on. It was I was part of the generation that gave birth to the term super predator. And if it, those who don't know, the term super predator w was created in order to vilify young black children. And that was a way for the media to see us as less than human. And then the criminal justice system latched on to what the media was doing. And then they got, you know, kids like me and my friends doing 15, 20, 25, 50, 100 years in prison. So when we when I went through that process, you know, my peers were were were, were just trying to figure it out this just the same way I was. And um but through the years, you know, I, I met some old timers, some, some, I never had a big brother, but I met uh, a guy named Hicks and he was someone who I, who I looked up to as a big brother and our birthday happened to be on the same day. And he used to tell me things like you move like the way I move. And he was revered in the prison environment, you know, and, and it was some positivity in that. It wasn't that he was revered for the wrong reason, even though, you know, you know, he was respected in that way. In that way, you know what I mean. But at the same time, he has some values with him as far as you know, budgeting your money. Um, don't don't be calling your family and asking them for money all the time. Use your commissary, whatever you get. Put a put a portion aside. Create a hustle while you're in there so you could be self-sustaining. Um, he had stocks while he was incarcerated and he would, he would try to invest in little businesses while he was incarcerated and, and some would work, some would fail, but I saw the way he was moving. So I started to do the same thing in my own way. And then it, and then it, it came to a point where I didn't have to call home to ask my mom to take money out of her paycheck to get me a pair of sneakers. I would get it myself. And then, you know, and, and even from selling cards, or, 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 or what they say, juggling on the outside. And I, and, and I think that that kind of conditioned me to be a hustler, but be a hustler in, in, in the legal sense. Because when, I, when I, I'm outside now, and my hustle is journalism. And no, not in a negative connotation of the word hustler, but just sustaining yourself and growing and, and trying to aspire to different levels because I don't want to ever stay at one level and I don't want my friends, family, or anyone I care about to stay at one level. And that's what I got from people like Hicks. And, and, and Lawrence, real quick, I want to go back to the uh, super predator. Can, like the history of super predator and stuff like that. And people don't understand when they use these terms, they make it, like you said, feel like less than. They made it seem like we were all animals. And these are the, 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 these you know, covert words they use to, to address, especially young black men. Can you can you can you give people a history where the word super predator first came from? Because I just I know you just said it, it came from um, the media latching on to it in the in court system, but where the term first uh, started from? Well, in, in 1995, there was a a, a professor uh, out of Princeton University named John DeJulio. He wrote he wrote a paper in the Weekly Standard, and and it's called and it, it was called the Coming of the Super Predator. It was a theory that, that he devised after looking at crime in this country. Um, remember in 1985, the Central Park case happened and they started calling them a wolf pack using am animal yeah. imagery to define them. You know what I mean? So then they came up with this term super predator and his theory was that in the, in the coming years, there's gonna be thousands of young people who are godless creatures who, who have who have no other vision of passion but to create mayhem to rape and murder and that's what was coming into this country and lawmakers reacted and they started sentencing a lot of kids to a lot of time in prisons and I, and with the Marshall project I recently I'm the I'm the um, executive producer and the host of a video series called Inside Story. And we just covered the super predator. And if you go back and take a look at that, you would see that uh, attorneys at that time, they were bringing their clients before a judge and the clients were just looking at, the judges were just looking at their clients like they're super predators. So no matter what the, the lawyer was saying, the judges weren't jacking it. 
and they were just looking to bury these kids. And um, mm -hmm. and that's what was happening. And that's why the prison system was so packed in the 90s and it was building so many jails. But if you go back and think about, you know, what got children to that point, you know, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. There was some crimes happen, but that was to some degree a branch off of the crack era. I know some yeah. people you're listening might be watching Snowfall at the time, and they had the CIA bringing drug yeah. drugs in yeah. from the war. But that was really happening. That was actual fact. And yeah. they came in our community, and then all this violence was as a result of this. And and it and it's black kids that was meant to pay the price. And super predator was one of those words that kind of forced us paying the price, so to speak. Mm. Lawrence, let me ask you this. Um, and I'm your age, and I remember the story. I remember when all this happened. And mm -hmm. at that time, we were, I guess, right on the cusp of gangster rap and the imagery and the videos. And then it got in the music where people was glorifying, um, you know, prison life and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. What can you say to young people today that kind of bought into that? Because all of my cousins and stuff that have done time always tell me it's nothing to glorify. They don't glorify it. But then there was people in our own communities that are trying to give the impression that, you know, something that was great about doing something or getting in trouble or whatever. Could you tell them the difference between kind of fantasy and reality for young people that may not know? Because right now we got a gang culture. We got people that just feel like, you know, I can do whatever and it's not going to bother me. Yeah, I think that, you know, those who were growing fire, they had it wrong. You know, they had it wrong for so many reasons. Um, when you when a person goes to prison, let, let's take me for instance. I went to prison at 17 years old. I did 27 years. Now the average person, you know, goes to work and and they go to high school, maybe college. They get out in their 20s. They start their career and they, they start building up their pension or their 401k. But but all that nonsense that led me to prison, I didn't come out with a with a pension. You know what I mean? So when when, when you when when folks start thinking about retiring. You know, for those who work their whole life, you know, to, to the 60s, you want to think about retirement. That's not a reality to me. So I have to I have to do something um, extraordinary in order to just get back to neutral where everyone is. And 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 to go a little deeper, when a, when a person goes to prison, you have you told when you can when you can take a shower. You told when you can use the phone. You got to pay to use the phone. Nowadays, you got to pay for an email, all the stuff that we getting for free, you know, and, and people talking down on you. They have dominion over your life. But then there are some people who are incarcerated who get sucked into that mentality and their whole existence, um, it, 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 it's their value lays claim in a table in the yard. This is my yard, my table in the yard. Nobody can sit at my table. When you old, you, you, you're, you're 60, 70 years old. What you gonna tell your grandkids? I had a table in a yard in Attica. Right. You know they they right. ain't, ain't nothing to spy to. The brother that you the brother that you had on before me was talking about STEM. He's talking about engineering. He's talking about um, creating a career. He was twenty six years old. He had a hundred k salary at oh, at, at twenty six year old. You know that's something that you could be proud of. You know what I mean you got you know, got I know so many people that I've met right now. That are doing so many magnificent things and they're doing it the legal way and um and you know but if you get caught up into that that illegal thinking you think it's all on um, what you see in rap videos etc that can lead you to a to a to a deadly and a cold end behind a prison cell you don't want that Absolutely. Mm, mm, mm. Lawrence um I want to ask you this um I do I do remember when your incident happened um at the theater um the one thing I wanted wanted to say is because I've had I've had conversations with people that have been to jail, and I always tell them it's not over. It's over. You know what I'm saying? You're still alive. You're still breathing. I want to commend you for turning your tragedy and not giving up and still moving forward. The thing is, I want you to let try to make, get people to understand that you did 27 years in prison. How did you acclimate that society out? And if it was, how difficult was it for you? Or was anybody in your life that came along and helped you with this process? Because I know 27 years being out of society, that's a tremendously long time. Yes. I mean, I, I could sit here and I could tell you 
what it was like for those 27 years that would make it hard for me to reacclimate, but I'll be here forever. There's just so much stuff that went on. So I don't want nobody listening to say, you know, this brother seems like he got it all together. He did 27 years. He's all right. Then I can yeah. do it. It's extremely hard. I yeah. know people who were my peers that by by time we we got halfway through our sentence, dudes lost their mind. They take your medication. Then psychiatric wars, they, they hang up. They kill themselves while they're incarcerated. They get so consumed in, in, in violence that they create so many enemies that they got face full of cuts. They got stab wounds all over them. They get hooked on drugs. They come out, they get hooked on mm -hmm. drugs. As soon as they come out, they go back to jail because they picked up dope habits while they're in there. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's very tough to make it out. But, um, when, when a person is in a, a, a tough situation, a person got to be tougher mentally so the person won't be consumed by that. And for me, it was it was trying to have a balance between um, feeding my mind and feeding my body at the same time. I needed that balance. There was times when I had nobody come and see me. Early, I spoke about my wife and, and my parents and all that. There was times when I went four four years without a visit. When 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 it would and it, that would make you become bitter, just like everyone else around me. But you know, but I knew that I didn't want to live there forever. So I didn't want to get sucked into doing something totally crazy. While I'd be like a friend of mine, Mag, who um you know police was abusing him for so many years that he cut two officers. And he got 15 extra years onto his 25 to life. After he did 25, he got 15 extra years. And he went he went to solitary confinement in 1995. And he just came out in 2020. Mm. From 1995 to 2020, he lasted for 23 hours a day in one cell in solitary confinement. He just wow. came out. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I want the, the listeners to know that, that it's tough. So it's not a place to be. But the way I was able to, to, to get out of that, you know, I watched the mistakes of my peers. And I wasn't going to do anything that was going to sink me there forever. And at the same time, particularly the last nine years of my sentence, I told myself I was going to grind super hard and I was going to network. I knew, that to, I knew that I wanted to be transferred to a facility closer to New York City. Because the facilities that have all the programs, the college and the arts program, they're closer to the city because the volunteers from the city come in and, and bring resources in, and that's connection for us. So I did that. And 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 um I created a lane, I created a reputation, and I went into the college programs. I ain't just do it in order to, you know, get a passing grade so it could look good at my parole board. So I got a degree. If I got an A minus, I was pissed off, and I took it really seriously. The professors, you tell me, calm down, but 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 to me, it was super important to try my hardest and everything. And if I didn't if I didn't do exceptionally well, that means that I did something wrong and I didn't figure something out. So I got to go back to the lab and try to figure it out because I know I was going to need those skills when I got out. And um, and when I was going through my parole board process, I went through like a. A, 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 a crazy, um, unnatural parole process. I went to five parole boards in seven months. Well, usually a person goes to five parole board, it takes 10 years. That means a person didn't make it and had to come back two years every time. But I had appeals, some series of do-overs, but it was psychologically stressful. And, and a friend of mine told me that I should write that down. Actually, a volunteer who I met was coming in. And she, I should write my experience down. And I told her I was fighting for my life. I don't want to write that down right now. But as I went back to my cell, I thought, I said, yo, if I write it down, I might be writing for someone who is less articulate than me. And they could, and, and getting that story out there, they might be able to use that. What's happening to me happened to that brother Lawrence. So I wrote it about the parole situation, how unfair it was that they judging me about who I was 27 years ago when I had created this long reputation for 20 years inside that 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 warden, superintendents, captain, incarcerated people know me to be someone totally different that was on that paper. And um, so so I did that and I ended up getting published by this national news organization called the Marshall Project while I was still on inside. But I made it and 30 days later I came out and 
they called me to their office to talk about my parole experience and they offered me a job and um and then then after that man the, the rest the rest was was history I, i'll tell you a little more about that um with, with the next yeah. coming question but yeah so i see one, one comment from my brother cj said it takes a hold on we get back to it jamie can you pull the question up that cj just said a, a comment that cj said it takes him yeah and it, the, uh yeah the most time it takes us yeah it takes about the same amount of time because i have friends that came home it takes them a long same time to adapt to how society is as much time as they did in prison how much time it takes you to adapt when you get back in out here in the streets and stuff like that so Lawrence, so, uh, real, real quick question i know you, you spoke on like the young brothers having difficulty can you tell people about the literacy problem that you see in incarcerated and do you think that's a factor why some of these young brothers wind up in incarcerated because of the literacy problem that we have outside on the street and the education system on the community might be failing them yes there was a recently there was a study done and it said that three out of five incarcerated people can't read and 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 that's the issue that's one of the reasons why i created inside story it's a video series because i have news inside which is a print publication that you spoke about earlier but inside stories the video public uh, is the video series that mm. for people who can't read they can watch the news because you don't have to read the news but but mm. that is an issue but there mm. but there are there are ways to address that especially when you on the inside i mean you don't have nothing else to do but to read a book you have mm. other things you can do but reading a book can 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 get you someplace uh, and mm. um and I, I remember there's a friend of mine named ace he used to go out in the yard and sit down and, and help brothers on past their GED. And then he used to get a couple of us to be tutors to people. We used to help people learn how to read. So there's avenues where, where a person can learn and they don't have to go to the prison administration in order to help them learn. They just have to go to their brothers and sometimes their brother is someone next door. And now I wanna ask you, can, uh, the publication, you said the new inside, the Marshall Project, can you tell people more about it? And I want to talk about some of the articles that you write in like, it's like journalism that's going on currently. I've seen articles you wrote about COVID-19 and it's so much relatable stuff that's going on outside that you also, to me, the, the articles make brothers that's inside feel like they all still a part of society. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, the the print publication, but first let me say, when I, when, I, when, I, when I got out and I started working in Marshall Project, I was tasked with getting familiar with our website. And the Marshall Project is like, think of them as like the New York Times of criminal justice. It's like mm -hmm. uh, the editors from New York Times work for us, et cetera. We just have this this um, relationship. And so the standard of writing is pretty high. Um, so I was tasked with looking at our website to get familiar with what we do. And when I saw it, I knew that people the inside could use it because it was all about criminal justice and they could use it like quoted as sources in a paper, et cetera. And um, mind you, this is like one of my first times ever seeing the internet because I was gone for like 27 years. And and that's a sidetrack, but one of the things that brothers struggle with and sisters struggle with when getting out is technology because they haven't seen it before. So it's very tough to reacclimate. And it, like you, like a brother say, it might take 27 years. You do 27 years, it might take you 27 years to, to acclimate. But if you if you grind on the inside and read and, and, and be a part of different processes and want to learn and speak it to your family, oh, what's this phone for? What's Amazon for? What's the password? And that's how you learn. But um, when when, when I saw our website, I, I I said, all right, I could. Nobody on the inside has the internet because the internet is not allowed. So I, I end up cooking this idea to create a print publication, taking our award winning journalism and put it inside of prisons. So I got the whole, the uh, executive team of the Marshall Project in, in one room. And mind you, these are folks like 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 Bill Keller, who, who's been the um, editor in chief of the New York Times for 30 years, interviewed Obama, um, been behind the Iron Curtain. He's like one of the, arguably one of the most powerful men in the country for the last 30 years. Him mm -hmm. and others in a room, and I pitch an idea to them to, to put this print publication and I promised them that within a year's time, I have it in 20 facilities in 10 states. But in a year's time, I got it in over 300 facilities and 25 wow. states. So, you know, it was, thank you, brother. Yeah. So it was, a, it, wow. it was a huge success and people really gravitated towards it on the inside. And um, 
right now they they it's in over 636 facilities in 41 states wow that's what's up brother. That, 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 that's major that's major and, yeah. they, and, they, and they need stuff like this people got to understand the stories were going inside and then people are in, out, inside i gotta understand like i mean they get the news and stuff like that but hearing it from a journalist like yourself directly i think it means so much more and it's, it's so much of a difference than somebody like myself or anybody like that doing it. i think it's so much more we, we definitely need brothers like you out there and that was okay go ahead go ahead, go ahead Kevin. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry just one thing that you said that really stuck out on me you said um early on in the interview you said i realized i don't think i belong in here and did that have something to do with how, because I, I realized now, I, I know people that have been incarcerated for a long time and you can see it, they, they wear it. It's become, it, 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 they're, they're engrossed in it. it. I don't see that with you. I wouldn't know unless you said it. And it just seems like you, you were in there, but like you said, your mind went other places. And we just had an incident um, and, and the gentleman and I talked about it on the show where these two young ladies uh, tried to carjack some gentleman and they wind up killing them or something like that. And so right now, everybody's afraid they're going to wind up going away for a really long time. And, you know, we got a lot of young people that society is saying, we're throwing you away. You know, you, you start to wear this almost this mark on yourself and, and you get labeled. What do you say to young people that, that may have found themselves in a situation where they are locked up or they're facing some time? What do you say to them? I say that, you know, the deck is definitely stacked against them. We already know there's two criminal justice systems, one for people of color and one for white people. So it's gonna be really tough for a person to get a fair shake um, if you're a person of color for one. But no matter what color you are, if if you come from, uh, you, you don't have money in the family, so you don't have enough money to pay for like an expert witness to help you defend yourself because the prosecutor is definitely gonna have multiple expert witnesses to sink you. And, and you don't have nothing to feud against that. That's why so many people go to prison for a long time. But what you, what a person can do is do something that a, a new phenomenon, they, they're calling it participatory defense. So what that is, is, you know, you get family members to get baby pictures of you, pictures of you playing football or legal, little league, get family members to write letters about, you know, who you are as a person. Your teachers to write letters about who you are as a person, and and all your your, your trophies, picture your trophies, whatever certificates you had, put all that together in a packet, and you present it to the judge and have your lawyer talk about this because this is a book of who you are, and these are, these are dozens of people attesting to who you are. So even if a person is guilty of whatever he or she or they committed. They can at least say, "Yo, listen, you know, I, I I made a bad choice, but this is really who I am." And 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 a lot of times, a, a who has that on um, participatory defense gets marginally, uh, gets not marginally, gets substantially less time than a person who does not. So that would be my advice to someone who's going through the system. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to come to buy up. Any other brother got another? For us to ask my next question. <laughs> well, I, well let me ask one last one. I promise this is the last one. I got it. I've got to know this. You know, like I said, again, I know where I was at in 1990, which was, I think, 11th grade. And I'm, I'm thinking for Lawrence to sit there, and I always, that was always a fear of mine, to sit there and have somebody just spew out a certain amount of time that you can go into a building and not come out and just lay, lay down a gavel, and that's, that's it. You know, what was going through your mind to be a kid, to be a teenager and have somebody tell you, we won't see you possibly until you're 40 something years old. What what, what goes to a 17 year old's mind in that position? I mean, I remember when, I remember at one time I was thinking about the worst, worst I can get is five years. And I was like, five years, I'm 17? Oh my God, that's gonna be so long. But, you know, when it hit me, when I was, going through the trial process. Mind you, when you're young, you think you're invincible. You don't think that you're gonna go away for 25 years, no matter what anyone say. And that's not because young people are stupid, it's because their brains aren't fully developed at that time, so they can grasp the gravity of what they're doing and the consequences that come out. It's just physically, they just can't do that. You know what I mean? So. Um, when when it when it finally dawned on me after I got convicted, I know that the statute like the least I can get is twenty five years. So 
that after I remember I got convicted, two weeks later, I had to go back for sentencing. In the morning when I, I got up in the bed, and I had a sleepless night, before I went to sentencing, I put my headphones on and I was listening to WBLS. And WBLS, they say, it was the lady, I think she's on it now. She's on a morning show. And she said, today, Lawrence Bartley goes to get sentenced. And my stomach just started doing flips. And I was just like, oh, man. And when I got before that judge, they gave me the 27 years, man. I knew it was coming. It's like a horror movie when you know that the that the, the killer is coming to get you, but they ain't get you yet. You hide it. When they finally get you, I mean, it's, it's like worse. You torture, anticipating, waiting for it to come. But when it come, it's just 10 times harder. And, and, it, and it, it was just rough, man. And, uh, and I'm, I'm surprised that I didn't get plunged into a uh, mental, uh, mental health situation at that time because those two weeks after that, I was in a deep, dark place. And, um, you know, and, and ironically enough, a haircut pulled me out of that place. You know what I mean? I got a haircut. You know, this was, it's like, yo, man. I, Did you get the hot top fade? You got a hot top fade? Did you get a hot top fade, man? Nah, you know, I was never one of I was a 360 wave kind of guy. You know what I mean? Oh, 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 you, 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 you had a spin it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had spin it, man. I was one of those type of dudes. And it was a hey. tough situation. I had the waves, and I just held on to that, man. Most, that most, got me through. This is the most important question. Murray's, Sporting Wave, or Dax? Oh. You know what you know to, to keep it tall man um i have uh, you know I'm, I'm i'm guyanese so my my, my grandma is, is portuguese and she's raised guyana so i passed down i got that what they say good hair it was just hair you were making a seasick, boy. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. I could put Vaseline in it with seasick. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lauren, first of all, this is probably one last question before we wrote all the stuff you have going on. If a guy's coming home from prison, he's a great writer in prison. How can he do? Do you guys hire people, or how does that work out with the with the journalism with you guys? What what you do over there? Yeah, it's very hard to get to get a job in in, in journalism, especially um, a, a organization like mine. Because mind you, a lot of my peers like they went to Ivy League schools for, for journalism and got graduate mm -hmm. degrees for that. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's 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 gonna be real tough to get a job like that. You have to go to to graduate school and you learn all the nuances of, of journalism and then come and apply for a job when a job is open. It's not impossible to a case in point. There's a person who's incarcerated now named John J. Lennon. He's been writing for at least 10 years. And, mm -hmm. and what he does is he, 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 he writes articles. He's been pitching it to different journalist organizations in order to publish his stories. And they've been publishing them. So he, he had a lot of no's, but he got yeses. They started publishing them. And then you know, he, he built up his his writing chops while he's incarcerated. So he comes home today, he definitely got a career. So mm. I, would, I would tell a person who's on the inside to just write, read stories that he like, that he sees that he like, and, and write them. They're giving people a dollar a word. Imagine mm. a 5,000 word piece. Sometimes they're mm. giving you dollars a word. You know what I mean? If you're doing it freelance, but if you have a salary, you know, what I mean, a, a person can get a pretty distance, decent salary as a as a writer, and then become an editor. You get into the high six figure range, and and so forth. And then editor in chief, and you make it like two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's wow. definitely a, a decent career. Mm. Yeah, Lars, yeah, Lar, do you have any like uh, like your story is very interesting? Did anybody approach you like movies, television shows, anything like that? For anything like that? Yeah, man. Recently, I just turned down hosting a, a, a show, but um, I, I have a show now called Inside Story. But, you know, there's been documentaries done on me. There's voices from within out there. There's one that didn't come out yet. It's called um, um, Second Shot. Uh, you know, there's, there's various things I've been doing. You know, I write I write a lot. And, uh, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, there's a lot to come. I don't want to say too much because it ain't out yet, but there's a lot to come. Okay, okay. I was, I was asking, we can't find some of the stuff that was about to come down the road, like, you know, down the pike there. I want to make sure we know so we can promote that. Now, you know, we got to take care of each other out here, man. 
So I just want to make Absolutely, sure that. Man. Absolutely, man. Just so I'm just going to marshallproject.org. You know what I mean? It's, we named after Thurgood Marshall. And um, you can see all the work we did. I just published something on Monday called I'm Not Your Inmate. It's about language, language and journalism, because language you use, like I spoke about Super Predator earlier, you know, sometimes the language you use, like inmate, prisoner, offender, felon, convict, those are labels, you know what I mean, that cause people to get discriminated against. So we rather use people first language, like incarcerated person, person mm -hmm. in prison, person in jail, or simply call a person by his or her, her name. You know what I mean? That's a way to, you know, to, to just, you know, I mean, not dehumanize a person and, and hopefully other media organizations will, will take that on and put our guidance in their style guide mm -hmm. and, and you won't see them talking about people in that manner anymore. I got, I got this, I'll keep saying one more question, last question, but all right, Swift, um, like you go around teaching young people to, to stay away from gun violence and stuff like that and speak on it and stuff like that. Am I correct? Well, I, I did Voice from Within, and that's all about anti-gun violence. That's a, doc, a a short a short documentary that I did while I was incarcerated. So mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes I do do go out and do that, but primarily I'm a journalist. I'm on the business yeah. side of journalism. I have publication and a show, so that's what I do primarily. But I usually I do a lot of talks. I talk to a lot of college kids, but it's usually about the nuances of the craft of, of journalism and and depicting people and whatever we have going on that's relating to the criminal justice system. Can, can I, uh, so with that question, I'm just saying like, you know, with the, all the shootings going on recently and stuff like that, and uh, your thoughts, are you have any thoughts on like uh, the gun restraint, gun, anything like that with, with President Biden might be saying and stuff like that and laws. What are your thoughts on that if you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there's, you know, these some of these gun laws are crazy, but uh, I know people, mm -hmm. Like for instance, one of the thoughts I have is that there's actually there's people who reach out to me who, who are incarcerated. And, you know, they hear on the news, let's say, um, let's take it away from the mass shootings for now. Because the mass shootings, mm -hmm. people say, you know, right to bear arms. We should have our right to bear arms, but then they're misusing it. But there's other people that say they want to use it to protect themselves. We have a right to protect ourselves. But then you look at, um, someone gets pulled over, he, he's unarmed, he gets shot by the police, and they say, this person was killed by the police, he didn't have a weapon, and he didn't have a record. So does that mean if a person had a record and he didn't have a weapon, that that person should have gotten shot? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's people who are incarcerated be like, yo, I'm cooked. I get out, man, nobody even gonna care about me if the police shoot me, and I don't even have my right to bear arms to protect myself and protect my children. So. You know what I mean? The, the laws are skewed in so many different ways. And um, I'll leave it at that. It's just it's just chopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, Lawrence, anything you want to promote before you go? Like, where can people find you? All your articles, your stories, your films, everything. Let us know everything. We want to get it all, brother. All people got to do is Google me. Lawrence Barley, I'm the first thing that's going to come up. It's always going to be something. I'm Lawrence Barley of the Marshall Project. You look on a Marshall Project website, you're gonna you're gonna see me um uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff. Stories I published. I just issue seven of News Inside just came out, and um it's all about you know vaccinations and COVID vaccinations and prisons, the pro oh. and con, everything yeah, about that. Are they, and we'll put, are, they, are they getting people the vaccine or what? Because my boy, my boy's in the Fed. He didn't get it yet. Well, people are getting vaccinated in prisons, but there's some controversy because there are, first, let's back up a bit. There's no social distancing in prison. So it's easy for a person to get a virus, um, especially coronavirus. Nationally, one in five incarcerated people have contracted COVID-19. And that's much more than in the public because there's nowhere to go. And they right. just started giving out masks and, and, and proper protective gear. So it's very tough. So in order to keep the community safe, it, it makes, according to the CDC and other medical professionals, it makes sense to vaccinate people who are incarcerated because guards and prison staff are bringing it into the facilities. It's passing around facilities like wildfire, then the guards mm -hmm. and prison staff are bringing it back out to the community, then it's passing around the community like wildfire. So it makes sense. But there are politicians who are saying, um, how are you going to vaccinate someone in prison who committed a crime where 
we have someone out here who haven't committed a crime, can't get the vaccine. So then it becomes a political football back and forth. But um, slowly but surely, people are being inoculated behind the prison walls. But there are a lot of people who have mistrust. They say, I don't want them to stick anything in me. But uh, they might be they might be because they might have racial issues. They think, oh, they don't care about me. They go put anything they want in me. So some of those thoughts are valid. You know what I mean? Some they've been experimenting on people who have been incarcerated for many years. And um, mm. so you know, what, what what I try to do is not try to make it not try to make decisions or advocate for anyone to do one thing, but I try to give people all the information they need to make the decisions for themselves. And that even goes to being inoculated or not. Yeah, Lawrence, man, listen, brother, we thank you so much for coming on, sharing your story, being so transparent, so honest about your story, man. We truly, truly are blessed to have you on this show, man. And I, I'm glad you're out there to the young people. I'm glad you're writing these stories. I'm glad you're going to do a story probably on you. I know and when you get that big check from those stories, man, you know, come make sure the brothers, let's chop it up. Have a dinner. <laughs> you, know, you got treated on dinner, brother. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't forget that when, you, when you big time, you know what I'm saying? You're big time and stuff like that. Yeah, like, so, so that was that great redemption story, man. Like, truly appreciate you, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you, brother. 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 Thank you, brother.